Thank you. Thank you very much. I was serious about being nervous. I was thinking about it earlier today, and I was told my colleagues, like, I don't know why I still get nervous. I talk about this stuff every day. This is my job. Two things just happened right now, um, both related to bike lane uprising that made me feel better about this, so thank you. Um, just when she mentioned the meeting tomorrow night, um, that uh, Alderman King is presumably trying to slip this one by you guys, or at least the folks that are gonna get screwed over by not having bike lanes on, it's on, Roosevelt or it's on Harrison? Drexel, Drexel okay. Um, so uh, the, just the fact that she told us about it, it's gonna give us an opportunity to get some of that information out and maybe get people to that meeting and let people know that people care about those lanes or about those parking spots. I don't know where you stand on the, necessarily on, the, on that issue. So um, it's exciting to be a journalist and be able to like, find out something like that and get that out to people. Um, and also she said we helped her go viral, which I didn't know, and that <laughs> makes me feel good um, because that's another great thing about it is every once in a while we will write about someone who has a really good cause or a really sad cause or something that's um, important that people don't know about and we'll put it out there and it will blow up and um, we feel like you can walk away and that we did a little bit of good that day. So um, let me back up a little bit. Um, uh, I'm Seamus, I'm uh, editor-in-chief and a co-founder of Block Club Chicago. My other co-founders are Jen Sabella and Stephanie Lule, who are infinitely smarter than me, but Derek talked me into this today. <laughs> um, Derek and I share uh, office space um, across town. We all went in together with seven other companies and um, we're getting like a screaming deal on an office, kind of similar to this one right now. Um, so um, our backstory is interesting and it helped us, uh, me get here because um, we, we used to be called DNA Info. I don't know if you guys had ever read um, DNA Info, Chicago. Um, stupid name. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if, 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 if the inventor of that name is watching it, I apologize. But um, it, was, it was kind of a while to get people to like that name or at least know what that name was or stood for. Um, I can't say that I am 100% sure what it stood for. Um, <laughs> to this day, um, but we were uh, local news. Uh, we covered news in Chicago's neighborhoods. Um, uh, you know, no story too small. We'll write about, um, you know, a, a crack in a sidewalk that, uh, you know, that people keep tripping over and the city won't fix um, or didn't know about. Um, or a big story, you know, we'll, we could, you know, uh, have something blow up and, you know, have some real change. Um, we were around for five years. We, um, we had a, a loan funder um, and he, the goal was um, unabashedly and uh, was to make it a profitable business. Um, how can we make local news profitable? Seems, I mean, eh, even five years ago, that was, it would have been a tough one. Um, to me right now, it seems perfectly clear that that is uh, probably impossible, certainly on the scale that um, DNA Info, or certainly Block Club, is trying right now. So, um, long story short, uh, he shut us down. Um, uh, a couple things went into it, but um, uh, the clear thing to me always was that if we we're going to be a profitable news company, uh, we had 110 million page views our last year. You know, we we had the sort of the volume to do it, but there really just is not the digital advertising dollars available to even someone that size. And that was sort of an eye opener, you know, it's sort of back of the envelope stuff now, but with Google and Facebook and increasingly um, Amazon uh, and Snap taking away a lot of the advertising, digital advertising money, there's really not much left behind for local news organizations. Uh, Revelation, to us, uh, for sure, at DNA Info. And so, um, yeah, one morning, or one afternoon, about 5 p.m., the site went dark. A uh, note went up and said, um, we're, we're out of business. And something funny happened um, after everyone stopped crying. Um, <laughs> it's somewhere between stopping crying and getting really hammered. Um, <laughs> we, uh, we started getting notes from people 
um, on our personal accounts. I'm not sure if the Twitter was still active at then. Um, but we started get, we started to hear from our readers that um, you know that they were really upset and that where were they going to find the news that we had been providing to them for for the last five years. And um, I, I know that sounds sort of obvious because that's what we did. But you know, we, at, at some point we were in a bubble. We were like, you know, you know, we were feeling sorry for ourselves. Um, but like that night, we were um, we were at uh, Big Star in Wicker Park, and um, people, you know, we started coming up with this this idea, like, ah, you know, what if, um, you know, what if we came back? And I was like, no. <laughs> I was like, we just got shut down. We're all out of work. I've got two kids and a mortgage. You know, no. And um, Almost like I wasn't even that nice about it, um, <laughs> but like the, the emails kept coming and the, the you know the tweets kept coming at us and um, you know when we sort of settled down after a couple of days, um, then the phone calls started coming in of people who weren't just like like let's do this, you know they weren't just like you should do this. They're like here here's a plan on how to do this. So um, it it got to be pretty cool and pretty. Um, uh, pretty interesting those first couple weeks after uh, Block Club clo um, DNA closed. I was like the only person left in the office. I was in charge of collecting computers and making sure like, I don't know, the lights were turned off. Um, I have a video of me turning off the lights that last night. It was, it was kind of sad. Um, and you know, we started just taking meetings with people that were interested in local news. And it really convinced us that uh, if we could come back um, we could revive a portion of DNA Info, rehire some of the same people, and, and, and try to bring local news back, because that's essentially what we are. We're just, you know, we're not trying to make money doing this. We're really kind of nerds about this. We want to get the local news out there because we get a weird thrill out of like informing people stuff that's happening. Um, and that's sort of what journalists do all along. You know, it's like if you can get some weird thrill into telling someone that they don't, something that they don't know and getting them to tell their mom or their girlfriend or their boyfriend and spreading the news, you, you sort of feel like you've, you've left a mark at least on that day. Um, so we restarted it. Um, the big difference was we said we should be a nonprofit. Um, you know, we were a no profit, so you know, it was not. It was just. It was a little bit more paperwork. Um, but uh, we did that. And we were, we felt pretty good about that right off the bat. It essentially meant turning our backs on any um, venture capitalist that wanted to fund us, um, and you know, and, and make it into a profitable business, and maybe flip us, maybe expand us, whatever. I mean, good intentions, but we felt like the lesson we learned at DNA Info was like this, there is not the money to be had out there to make profits on this, but, and nothing against profits, but um, it, it, it's, I think the tide's turning in, in local news. I think there's been more and more nonprofits being formed. Um, you know, we're just trying to fund, pay the reporters, pay the editors, expand if we can, pay the bills, and, and do this I don't want to say as a public service, but certainly as something to uh, help inform the public. Um, so, um, but you know that's easy to say. But being a nonprofit, you know that doesn't make any any money to pay the bills. So um, we were lucky enough to get. Oh yeah, I meant to flip that. That's what our website looks like, at least at like two o'clock today. Um, pretty simple. I mean, we're not we're not breaking any ground here. Certainly on design. But um, you know we're trying to do nice, straightforward news, um, covering lots of neighborhoods. Um, you know this is a good example. We got a story from downtown and from the east side, and from the west side. Another from downtown. This one's from Pilsen Little Village. Um, you know we're tr we're really trying to make sure we cover as much of the cities we can, not just you know like we're going to do a great job covering you know, Lincoln Park and, and, and Logan. Um, we're really trying to spread out around the city. That's another thing different about DNA and, and, um, and Block Club. But, um, but anyway, so the other big thing besides nonprofit versus profit is we said, and this is, you know, the controversial part of, in some waters, is that we think what we're going to do is going to be valuable to people um, to the point where they may pay for it. 
Um, we're not asking for a lot, um, but enough that we can pay the reporter that goes to the night meetings in Wicker Park and suffers through a lot of the, you know, the, the, the NIMBY stuff going on, and we, she can get a decent salary with health care, with benefits, you know, maybe sock away a little bit in the 401k. She's not going to get, no one's going to get rich in, in the news. Um, but so we started a subscription model, um, not a membership model. Membership model means please give to us and you'll get a tote bag. Um, and, but you can still keep reading our news. Um, our subscription model for us is please subscribe to us and you get a tote bag. Um, <laughs> and, and you can get access to all of our news. So, you know, again, that's not all that different. That's what newspapers have been doing all along. You pay them and they deliver the paper to your front door. You know, eventually you pay them and they'll, that you won't hit a paywall anymore. But being a nonprofit and being a subscription is a little bit of a weird hybrid that we've entered new ground a little bit, um, according to the lawyers. Um, <laughs> uh, but, it, but it, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. It's a, it, it's a, a blend of um, reader-supported money. Uh, um, nonprofit allows us to go to charitable foundations and say, hey, how would you like to have good coverage on the west side of Chicago, why don't you fund a west side reporter report for America or, you know, X corporation, why don't you do that and we'll, you know, you won't have any say in what we cover, but, you know, we could say you're the, you know, whatever, the, the report for America fellow covering the west side of Chicago. So um, we've had a lot of success getting foundations to support us. Um, we've got, proud to say, almost 9,000 paid subscribers. Um, after about a year, so if we keep on that track, maybe, you know, I won't have to turn off the lights again. Um, and, um, you know, and uh, again, to me it's not that crazy of an idea to say uh, it's, it's, it's valuable to get, you know, 20 stories a week about your neighborhood. I mean, it's, we hear all the time from people that, um, that they learned about something going on in their block that they didn't know about until they read it um, in, in Block Club. Um, that they, like this bike meeting tomorrow, will hopefully get something up tonight or tomorrow morning about that, let people know about it. You know, it's not necessarily the most important stories, but we're really going out of our way to telling stories that are different than the other media. Um, reporters are getting laid off every year in every newspaper. Um, and you know, at some point, another thing we, we're trying to do different is to, you know, we're not trying to re-report everything that everyone else does. Um, we're trying to cover things that other people aren't doing. If the Trib's got a great investigation, that's great. We'll tweet out their story. We'll support them. But so it started off just a couple of us. Um, thanks to all those readers that are subscribing or not subscribing, but sharing our stories and telling their friends about it and encouraging other people. Um, we're up to 13 people now. I know that's 14, but one's an intern that just left for school. Um, and um, yeah, so th you know, this is our family picture. We're really proud of it. Um, and you know, we're also trying to foundations, subscriptions. We're trying to get creative, um, do a little bit of merchandising. Um, <laughs> That was, uh, well, you recognize that guy, that, that fellow. Um, that was our story. Um, that, thank God for that picture. No one believed me. Because some guy called us and said, there's an alligator or a crocodile. He wasn't sure. And we didn't know. We were Googling it um, in the uh, Humboldt Park Lagoon. And I was like, I, I always believe this kind of stuff. This kind of stuff I always believe. Like, I believe you. <laughs> and everyone else, everyone else in the office was just like, yeah, the, our reporter was definitely like, why do you believe him? But he like described it and I said, well, like the important thing is, did you tell anyone? And he said, yeah, I went right to the park district guy and I, I reported it. I was like, okay, okay, that's a good sign. You know, like I know people that see crazy things do report it to other people. And, um, but you know, like, okay, we can, there's a paper trail we can check. So we went, chased our reporter out to the, to the scene. Um, she can't see him because, you know, he was pretty small. <laughs> um, but uh, you know, she gets a park district guy, and um, well, talking out of turn, but um, but uh, the park district person was just like stone stonewalled her, like no, 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 no. And there's a, there's a there's a guy in the background that saw it. Was like, <laughs> 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 
Um, and there was a picture of it. So um, a, pic a, pic a picture somehow found uh, his, its way to us. Um, and you know, we two witnesses that saw it, picture, were like, we wrote that story. There, th this was a new headline at, after the end of the day when the police were like, yes, there's an alligator living in the home. But, but anyway, we were proud of that one. That was turned out to be our, as you can imagine, our biggest story to date. Um, you know, we ran an online contest to name them too. Um, I was like, if you give people the chance to name them Chance the Snapper, they're gonna go, like, <laughs> call them Chance the Snapper. Sure enough, it was like 80%. Um, one of our, Co-founders Stephanie was like, "We should make T-shirts." Um, I was like, "I don't know. I'm always the I don't know guy. Like, I don't know if that's gonna work." And um, so we got that design, and we sold. Um, there he is. Um, we made that design. We sold T-shirts and tote bags, and it was like crazy. I don't know if like those. They're they're kind of pretty. After a while, but anyway, this was another way that we are funding um, Block Club. We could. We could say we could we could pay for like two full-time reporters with the number of T-shirts um, and tote bags that we that we sold. Derek has been watching me fold tote bags and T-shirts since <laughs> since like June 12th. Um, but anyway, it's just I bring it up as an example of um, just uh, look, and that's the guy. That's Gator Rob. We sent him a shirt, and he wasn't kind enough to wear it. Uh, he's like a celebrity now. Um, and you know, it's just an example we like to point out of that we're willing to try to get creative on this. Um, covering local news is a lot of fun. Um, it's really can be really exciting, and it also can be very dull. Um, we say like we'll cover these meetings so you don't have to go to them. Um, but we're, you know, we don't want to we don't want to end up as D the DNA info story. Um, we own the rights now to DNA info copyright, so I feel like I can keep saying DNA info. Because <laughs> um, I don't know how long it's going to take for people to, to um, start associating Block Club with local news. Um, I know a lot of you guys know it. I still do the test, you know, out in bars and like, they're like, where do you work? Block Club Chicago. Like, where? Have you heard of DNA info? Yes, okay. So one of these days that's going to, uh, I'm not going to have to do that anymore, but um, we're psyched just to be alive still. Um, we got, I should also mention, because it plays into um, the room. Um, we got a some initial startup funding from a group called Civil, which is a, oh boy, how do I explain it? It's a blockchain-based operation that we're part, we're an early member, we're one of a network of newsrooms around the country that are joining their registry. And there's a crypto element to it that hasn't quite worked out, but, um, but they're, they're, you know, they're sort of knocking on the door on ways that they can make blockchain an effective way to spread and archive and preserve news. Um, we haven't yet found a way for it to fund news, um, but they're working on it. Uh, it whether civil is, m makes it work or someone else does. Um, it was interesting and we were psyched to try to jump on board, but again, throw it in the pile of all like different ways to fund news because once places like us go away, once DNA info went away, once the Sun Times ever goes away, like having fewer people out there, you know, reporting on things, and guys like you, the, I heard a lot of data workers out here, like folks that can get data out to the public and show them what it means, it's hugely important because in Chicago we know if you leave the, power that, the powers that be alone, bad stuff eventually starts to happen. So I'm not saying like all journalists are you know, saviors or anything like that, but um, there's a lot of, you know, the more light you can shine on something, the less likely that, well, no, they, kill, they still go to jail anyway. But like the stronger the case the feds will have. Um, so anyway, um, what else, what else can I say? I'm definitely gonna take questions um, I'll try to explain the blockchain element of it, but I'm terrible at it. Um, I'd much rather talk about alligators. Um, let's see. Um, oh yeah, I want to say like just what's next. Um, if if you guys live in a part of town that does not have a full-time reporter, we get a lot of this now. Is like, how come you don't cover my neighborhood? Um, we are um, aggressively 
looking to hire reporters, say Lakeview, Lincoln Park, uh, <laughs> we get a lot of questions about, about Beverly, uh, Bronzeville. We've got pockets of the city that we're still um, excited to fill, hopefully in the next year, so that we sort of completely cover the city the way um, DNA Info is getting close to doing. We're up to um, 13 reporters, as you saw. Um, I'd love to get up to 20 reporters and a couple more editors and, and really keep bringing it, but the, the point is just to keep the local news flowing and um, sort of we appreciate everyone in this room that's ever clicked on a story or shared a story or subscribed or tipped us off or you know, told us there was an alligator in the lagoon. Um, we, we, could, we couldn't do it without um, our readers and our supporters and, um, and I appreciate it and love to take questions if anyone's got any. My question is, there is a, um, a food drive going on for uh, canned foods uh, downstairs in the lobby called Canstruction. Uh, they're different uh, sculptures made out of soup cans and different things. And one of those sculptures is Chance the Snapper. Oh my God. Were, were, were you aware that, well, am, that, that, that your alligator is uh, enshrined in the sculpture in this building? And do you get a... Um, do you have some sort of licensing agreement, or are, are you getting a, a, a portion of the of of, of any of that uh, fundraising? <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll look right at the camera and say, "No, Mr. Chance the Rapper, we are we do not have any copyright on that." Um, no, that's awesome. I did not know about that. I used to work next door, and um, I've been seeing those sculptures for a while, and, and they're super cool, and they. I definitely get nervous around them, like I'm just gonna like, go down and knock down. Um, what was Chance the Snapper made out of? Was it Campbell's soup cans, do you know? I guess it'd have to be green. It, it was mostly tuna. Gotcha. All right, I'm taking a picture on the way out, and that'll, that'll be another story. I'm up to two stories so far that I'm gonna have to write tonight. Um, no, that's awesome. Uh, you know, it, it was fun, and that's what we've um, kind of been just telling everyone, like, oh, it was the rare Chicago story in a sort of a, uh, you know, a lousy summer um, that everyone knew about, everyone could get behind. Um, there was nobody got hurt. Um, uh, you know, it was just, it was fun, it was light. I think this, the city needed a story like that and I um, was really happy that, that um, Block Club was involved with that. And um, no, but we, uh, we don't get any money from the tuna <laughs> alligator in the lobby. So sometimes uh, local news outlets, when reporting on crime specifically, have a tendency, especially in fast-moving situations, to sort of quote what the police have been saying and then move on from there. Um, what kind of approach does Block Club Chicago generally take to crime reporting, especially around different constituencies' experiences of crime beyond uh, whatever the police department would say about a particular incident? Yeah, that, that's a good question. That's, um, there's lots of things sort of changing um, in journalism, um, uh, for profits turning into nonprofits, um, uh, and, and, and crime reporting as well. I think there's some more thoughtfulness going on um, out there. Um, you know, the way crime gets reported, you know, if you have uh, people to do it, is you, you hear about something, you get somebody out there, you know, you get a picture and then you talk to all the people that are congregated around and find out who knows what. And you get a lot of, as you would happen anywhere, you would ask 10 people what they saw, you're gonna get a lot of different stories and a lot of different information out there. So um, it's tough as a journalist on the street to sort of piece through what what's real and what's not. Um, the police department has been increasingly um, restrictive in what they put out um, over the years. It, you know, it's not just under Mayor Lightfoot, it's not just under uh, Rahm Emanuel. It was starting to happen under Rich Daly as well, where they sort of funnel everything through the downtown uh, spokespeople who aren't on the scene, they don't know everything, they're sort of reliant on the information that gets called into them. So, um, so it's tough, it's tough to, to try to get out there in a breaking news situation and report the full, accurate, true story. I mean, you can report partial, you know, the facts that you know, but um, what you never get, and I always sort of remind the reporters is like, you never get the why. 
on day one, which is what really people want to know. Um, so, uh, so it's a good one. I mean, we, we try to, um, you know, we try our best to get as, as much of the information as possible. Um, we've had a little bit, I would say, of less of a focus on covering crime. Um, you know, for better or for worse, you know, it, crime doesn't necessarily go away because um, people aren't writing uh, stories about it, but, um, but we do sort of have a, uh, it definitely an interest in how a misreported story could impact the community. Um, or even a, a well-reported story, but um, yeah, it's you know it's something that you know every story that we write sort of goes through the through the um, you know the machine of like do we have enough to go with? Is this description useful? Um, we're you know we're always very careful about descriptions because um, you know you may say this person is like five. Well, we, I'll give you an example. Yesterday the description came over and the guy was between five foot eight and six four. 180 and 240. And I was like, holy cow, that's like, that's like half the city. Um, like, how useful is that, you know? So, so sometimes, you know, we, we, and we get all kinds of grief from it from people that, that um, frankly, like, want to know, like, the race of the guy. I mean, that's what, that's what they're really calling to say, why don't you have a description of the guy? Um, and we're like, we are going to put the descriptions in there if they're useful to helping the public find them. Um, and that's sort of another thing that uh, news um, orgs have evolved with over the years. Um, there's more video out there, so sometimes you know, they don't have to give these vague descriptions that describe like half your family. Well, and, and you know, and put, could potentially you know, stigmatize people that have nothing to do with anything. So I don't know, I didn't answer your question fully, but I, I will say that you know, we are trying to be more thoughtful about uh, early stage crime reporting. Could you talk a little bit more about the credibility indicators you use? Was this original to you? I don't recall seeing that before. I'm not sure if they were referring to. Yeah, that. we get a lot of um, we get a lot of good feedback on. Um, let's see. Oh, I don't have them for you. Um, they're they're actually on the story, and they they're on the on the left rail. Um, uh, this is uh, this is actually a civil creation, um, so we didn't come up with the idea, but we're the only civil newsroom in Chicago, so we're the only ones using them. Um, basically, um, it, it, we're we're trying to show why this writer may be an authority on the subject. So um, over here on the on the left, um, and we we just put these on manually. The editor does it. Um, was it an or original report? Yes, our reporter went and found this. He interviewed the folks. Uh, he wrote it. Um, did he actually like go out on it, or did he, you know, do it from his kitchen? Which is, you know, you can get a lot of good stories by, you know, uh, over the phone. And I'm not denigrating that. I'm just saying, like, when you go out and interview people, you certainly get better pictures. Um, and uh, sources cited. Um, that, that one's sort of a, a little nebulous, but you know, are you citing official uh, authoritative sources that, um, you know, just to sort of, you know, prove it. Um, we have a couple others. Um, there's one that says like, this person is a subject matter specialist. Um, but yeah, it's just sort of a way to, to signal to the reader that we're on the scene of something, that, that we are out there, we're not aggregating it, um, which happens a lot, um, a lot to our copy as well. Um, and we, we just think it's just another way to show people that we're actually in the neighborhoods. We're not just parachuting in, you know, once a year when something terrible happens. Uh, so I read recently on ProPublica that they've had a lot of success over the last few years collaborating with other journalistic organizations. Have uh, you all been thinking about how you might collaborate with the other nonprofit or for-profit uh, organizations in town? Excellent, thank you. It was on page two of my very high-tech uh, yellow legal plaid uh, to talk about. Um, that is one of the cooler parts about being our, um, our own bosses. Um, there is no red tape to, to collaborate with another organization, um, so we've done it. Um, ProPublica had this huge database of parking tickets. Um, not parking tickets, I'm sorry. Um, is it parking tickets? Is there parking tickets or city sticker tickets? Um, or, or is a combination of both. And they did some stories on it, but they, they came to us, um, Louise Kiernan, uh, bless her heart, the editor-in-chief there, and 
said, let's team up. Um, here's our database. Uh, here are our uh, data experts to help you navigate it, but why don't you go through it and see what the news is in here? So um, our reporter Kelly Bauer spent a lot of time with this data and, and culled all these great stories out of it. And, um, and then we just uh, co-bylined it with, um, uh, with ProPublica. Um, so it was th that was a collaboration in the fact that, in the sense that they, you know, they brought us the raw materials and then we created it, we went out and reported it. Um, and we're, we're hoping to do a lot more with them um, as well. They are fantastic. Um, we've collaborated with um, the Daily Line, which covers City Hall. They're a for-profit. Um, we've collaborated with uh, uh, City Bureau. They're a nonprofit. Um, th there's tons of them. Chalkbeat, Chicago. Um, we share a, an office as well. Um, Derek knows them as well. Um, so yeah, we're, we're game with collaborating with, with, with anyone. If it makes sort of the news landscape in Chicago better or stronger, um, we're all for it. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, e it's really easy to do, um, to say we're gonna do it, but you know, getting under the hood and really doing it, um, we're really gonna put a um, emphasis on that next year as well. So if anyone wants to team up with us, give us a call. Hi, I uh, have a subscription to you guys, and I have a subscription to the Tribune. Um, but I think, like most people, like I tend to read from a lot of different random things that kind of pop up all over the place. Um, I'm curious. Um, this is more of like a big picture thing, but I'm curious um, what your thoughts are. If, like, is there any solution in the future that, in order for newspapers and news sites to stay around, that doesn't involve people buying like eight different subscriptions and spending a ton of money or is there some sort of an umbrella subscription in the works or anything like that? Yeah, we, it, yeah we've, we've, we've talked about that, that wouldn't, you know, wouldn't that make a lot of sense that if you could get like a city pass, um, you know, and it, it would be great for the news organizations, um, you know, to, uh, to, to all team up because it is nuts, right? You know, you're, you're, you're logging in four different times and uh, um, paying four different bills, even if they're, you know, totally reasonably priced. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, I think that would I think that would be great. You know, it makes it makes perfect sense to me. You know, like a Chicago News Pass, where you know you pay a hundred bucks a year, and you know you don't you log in once, and hopefully um, uh, you never have to log in again, and you, you get everything. Um, but that's what you know. I'm no different than the than the Tribune, um, other than the Tribune and the Sun Times. They still get a ton of revenue from their print edition, which I'm sure they're like, oh boy, you know this thing is. You know, it, it's it's expensive to put that out, but so much of the of the revenue is tied up in it. It's hard to just turn their backs on it and go digital only. Um, but yeah, the, I mean, they they all need they all need the digital subscriber revenue, or or they can't pay their reporters and editors and art directors um, and all the you know all the important things that that go into um, putting out the news and making it. Uh, digestible and, and distributable. Do you use guest writers or bloggers for content? Uh, yes. Um, the short answer is yes. The long answer is um, I don't particularly care for those. Like, I wouldn't want to call them bloggers. Bloggers to me uh, suggest um, that they're sort of inject might be injecting um, opinion or, or into it. Um, uh, guest writers to me sort of, that, that's code word to me sometimes about like they're supporting a perhaps an uh, agenda or a product or something like that. Um, so no, what we do is we, we take contributors, uh, freelancers. Um, if you're a journalist or an aspiring journalist or an expert in the field who can, um, you know, write a story that's unbiased, that's well-researched, um, that's fair, um, and you can take some photos or point us to photos that we can use. Um, yeah, we're interested. Um, but to, uh, back to the thing about collaborating, it's another great thing about, about not having a, a lot of uh, red tape. Um, if we find someone and we vet them and they're legit, um, they're, we're happy to take their story and it, it expands our, our, our reach huge, hugely. Um, 
because we sort of have eyes and ears all over the city then. Um, if we tell people, if sort of deputize um, journalists out there uh, that are freelancers that, um, that want to make a little bit of money or they got a great story or they have a, uh, an itch they've been wanting to scratch or, or a, you know, a crazy you know, business that they've always you know, wanted to go in and ask the guy what their deal is and how about I do a feature story on it and say, Yes, that's a great idea. So yeah, we we're definitely we're definitely into it, um, and some of you know some of our our, our greatest stories um, can be traced back to um, freelancers. That I always look at freelancers as you know if they want to, they're somewhat auditioning for a full time job. I'd love to hire them all. I wish I had forty reporters um, and photographers, but um, it's a good way to sort of see what they got, what their um, you know what their sourcing is, their skill level is. So, um, yeah, we, and at DNA Info and at Block Club, we we definitely look to our freelancers first when jobs open. I had a question about um, the incentives that you had. I feel like approximately you've sort of done this thing twice: once in a for-profit model, once in a non-profit model. Um, did you ever find that it's like harder to do things that align with your values in one or the other? Did you find them to be about the same? Um, can you speak to that at all? Harder to do things that line up with my values. Um, you know, I, I've, I've never thought about that because you sort of, when you, you know, when you come into journalism, you sort of come in with a set of values that, to, to me, are pretty simple. Like the story better be true. Uh, it's fair. It's got you know as many sides of the story as you can find and, and accurately report. Um, it's not being reported because they're giving you money. It's not being reported out of some vendetta against somebody. It's just sort of, you know, straight news. And I know that sounds sort of Pollyannish, but I know that's kind of where I came from at um, the Daily Herald, where I was before in the Sun-Times and, and uh, DNA and Block Club, for-profit or non-profit. It, it, it doesn't really matter if, if you sort of get busted you know, you know, making something up or losing your credibility or selling stories for, for ad revenue, um, people find out about that and then they stop reading you. Then you're, you know, then you're, you're washed up at that point. So, um, so no, I wouldn't say for-profit, non-profit really impacts my, uh, my values, I don't think. 